So I'd like to talk about some of the diagnostic challenges we have in upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Uh, here's a list of uh, disclosures that I have, none of which are relevant to today's discussion. So the, the big issue with upper tract urothelial carcinoma is whether we need to get tissue and how we get it. So whether to biopsy, what, what are the what criteria do we need to treat it, and is biopsy necessary to treat adequately? If we decide we are going to biopsy, how do we biopsy? And uh, what do we do with the information with respect to risk stratification? Um, how do we decide who's going to get endoscopic ablation, who's going to get a nephroidectomy, and who's going to get chemotherapy before nephroidectomy? So if we look at the European guidelines as an example, you can see that every patient is supposed to be evaluated with a CT urine cytology, and cystoscopy. I don't think any of us would disagree with that. But then there's this plus minus flexible uroscopy with biopsy that is in the algorithm, but it doesn't really tell us uh, how to, to use ureteroscopy. In the text, you see the recommendation is to use diagnostic ureteroscopy and biopsy in cases where additional information will impact treatment decisions. I think this is the key. When, in which patients will biopsy change management? So let's ask the question first whether to biopsy. So most patients will start with a CT scan. We know that CT, CTIVP, or CT urogram is the best study for detecting upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Uh, it has the best sensitivity and specificity compared to, for example, an MR urogram. The MR urogram we preserve mostly for patients who, are, who cannot have a CT, for example, due to renal function or they want to avoid radiation. Um, there, of course, still is a risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis with poor renal function. The third study uh, in patients with poor, especially poor renal function who can't get either MR or CT is a retrograde pilogram. Uh, it needs to be done in addition to something like a non-contrast CT to look at the renal parenchyma, uh, and it does have a lower sensitivity than, than the CT scan. So where does CT fail us? It fails us with respect to sensitivity in small tumors. So you can see some of the numbers here, 96% of tumors between five and 10%, uh, five and 10 millimeters will be found by CT, but it goes down to 40% for tumors less than three millimeters. Also flat lesions are difficult or even impossible to detect by CT. Specificity is critical. If we see a filling defect, is it automatically cancer? The answer, of course, is no. There are alternative lesions to think of, but um, it's important to, to, to figure out how often uh, the uh, CT will be incorrect there. And then, of course, the question is, should all imaging be followed by endoscopic and histologic evaluation? So the question really is, if we see a CT like this with an obvious filling defect, is that adequate for us to do a nephroidectomy? If we have the CT plus cytology showing high-grade disease, maybe that'll be enough? Or do we need cytology and biopsy in addition to the CT? So the critical issues to, to consider when making this decision are, first of all, what do we want to get out of the biopsy? We want to get the confirmation of a, a tissue diagnosis of urothelial carcinoma. We want to know grade histology, meaning variant histology or just conventional urothelial carcinoma and stage, and we want to know if it's suitable for endoscopic management, which of course requires inspection and determination that it's low grade. But we have to also consider the downsides, the risks of a complication from the procedure, risk of disseminating cancer due to the procedure, and of course a delay in definitive uh, management by adding in an extra procedure. So one question that's not really answered well in the literature is how often do we get it wrong? How often, if we just go by CT scan, will the and, and we remove the kidney, how often will the histology be benign? This is one series from Korea that found the rate to be approximately 3% out of 244 nephroidectomies. Interestingly, a uh, disproportionate number were in the ureter, five. Um, none of these patients had a positive cytology, which, which some would see as, as a minimum criteria for doing surgery. Uh, and the benign lesions were, were various uh, relatively uncommon things. How good are we? So if we don't do a biopsy, but if at least take a look at it is, is one opinion that patient, that so urologists will often have. How good are we at visual recognition? So you can see on the on the left side here some numbers. 
So we had 40 patients who ended up with a biopsy and the urologist thought it was low grade in 70%, but eight out of these 28 were actually high grade. The urologist thought that 10 were high grade and two of the 10 were actually low grade. And the urologist thought that two out of the 40 were benign uh, when both were actually cancer. Overall, accuracy is about 70%. Um, but of course, it may not make a difference between high grade and low grade if a patient obviously needs surgery anyway. If we think as of uroscopic biopsy as the most we can do to enhance um, a diagnosis and, and to just define treatment, well, how good is it itself? It's, it also only has 80, 90 percent concordance between the biopsy we get, the, sorry, the grade we get on biopsy and the grade we get on nephroidectomy. And this drops significantly if the biopsy shows low-grade disease as a significant proportion, approximately a third, will be upgraded upgrade at the time of nephrodirectomy. And we know that biopsy is actually very poor for staging because it's very difficult to get a deep enough uh, biopsy. Only about two-thirds will have lamina propria in the specimen. So one of the, the big fears around uh, uteroscopy before nephrodirectomy is that the back pressure of the retrograde procedures would disseminate cancer cells uh, into the bloodstream. There's a reasonable meta-analysis here of almost 4,000 patients from eight studies that says that this doesn't happen. If anything, the um, hazard ratio favors ureteroscopy, but of course, this is probably selection bias in that the, um, the bigger, more obviously aggressive tumors uh, went straight to surgery without ureteroscopy. Uh, in any case, all of the outcomes measured were equivalent. There is, however, an increased risk of bladder recurrence. This comes out of multiple uh, retrograde, uh, sorry, retrospective studies, um, not any, any good prospective data, but I think that it's convincing that there is increased risk of bladder recurrence, and we should probably be administering a single dose of intravesical chemo uh, after ureteroscopy or even intraluminal in the upper tract as it's being done in some centers. So if we are struggling with biopsy, uh, how does urine cytology fit into the picture? I think it is, it is potentially more important for upper tract then with bladder because of difficulties in getting tissue and it, it itself acts as a de facto biopsy. So the utility of, of urine markers overall is similar in upper tract, except the sensitivity sen tends to be worse and, with, and voided cytology indeed also has less sensitivity than for bladder cancer. So that I would highlight that it's important to get selective cytology so that we get cytology from, from the, uh, the renal pelvis and ureter on that side or on both sides. And this, and this has a reasonable sensitivity of 71% for, for high-grade disease. And it may actually off, offer complementary value to the biopsy if, for example, a biopsy shows low-grade disease, but the cytology is high-grade, that may actually swing us to, to recognize that we're undergrading with, with biopsy. Cytology, of course, is particularly important uh, if there's no uh, visible lesion uh, where the cytology is then really defining carcinoma in situ. So a flat lesion we don't see with positive cytology we would consider to be um, carcinoma in situ. And I would say don't, don't forget the brush. Brush biopsies can also be very helpful. So just in conclusion on this part, I would say that there are no brainers for when to biopsy. Um, if there's diagnostic uncertainty, for example, trying to figure out if it's renal cell versus upper tract um, or if it's uh, indeterminate size or whatever else might be the case. Um, we definitely want to do ureteroscopy and biopsy if it, if it looks small and we can probably ablate, so if it's small and low grade, so we'd want a biopsy to confirm it but ablate while we're there. And if we think that a patient's suitable for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we really should get uh, a tissue confirmation before proceeding with chemotherapy. I think the difficulty comes in the patients who have tumor that is obviously infiltrative or, or significant in size. The cytology perhaps is positive, which is confirming there's really something going on. They're not eligible for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Should we just remove the kidney in those patients without doing biopsy? I think that's still an open question. So if we're going to do a biopsy, how do we do it? Well, usually we're talking about flexible ureteroscopy in the distal ureter. Of course, we can do semi-rigid ureteroscopy. There's a study uh, from the group in Paris, Olivier Traxé study, 
that shows that there are certainly advantages to digital ureteroscopy. You will see better. And I, and I personally think that visualization is so important that the digital ureteroscopy is a game changer, although you may lose a little bit on um, deflection of the tip, depending on the scopes. I have no personal experience with the single use ureteroscopes, but that is also something on the horizon. You have to choose your biopsy forceps uh, on the left here. And typically, um, we would always use a ureteral access sheath so that you can go up and down and get multiple biopsies. Uh, there's a study from a German group that shows that this one at the bottom, this is the Cook big opsy, that it give, gets the best uh, chunk of tissue because it has such a big biopsy forceps, uh, but it may also obscure uh, vision. So it's uh, they're typically uh, trade-offs. This is a quick video to, to show a technique for biopsy. I'll just highlight this paper from Petros et al. in, in Urologic Clinics in North America that has a few snippets on tips for, for um, biopsy. For biopsy, we'll often start with the forceps, but I think there are other tricks to consider, for example, using a basket to snare a piece of tumor and also to use the laser to lift an edge of a tumor, especially more sessile tumor, so that you have something that is is almost floating that you can then grab with the basket and, and pull out through the access sheath. So what do we do with the information? Of course, important for staging and risk classification. I think that the EAU risk stratification here, low versus high, is, is, is inadequate, that we actually need to be thinking more, um, you know, a low risk, first time small versus a, so a low grade, first time in small versus a low grade that is recurrent is a lot like bladder cancer, and we shouldn't lose that difference. Um, and a low-grade large tumor is different than a high-grade large tumor. And we're not only talking about nephrodectomy, but we also need to stratify for, for chemotherapy on the high-risk side. So there's, there's more to be gained than, than just in this um, dichotomous classification. So coming back to imaging in the context of staging, um, if we see infiltration of the muscle wall or deeper layers, it's usually accurate. So there's a high predict positive predictive value, but we don't actually see it that often. And I haven't put any numbers on this slide, but, but overall the, the negative predictive value for muscle invasive disease is relatively low. And so if we take biopsy data, this is just one series as an example, if a patient has high-grade disease on biopsy, it's about 60% chance that it's muscle invasive on nephrodectomy. So positive predictive value is 60%. If we, if we see lamina propria invasion, which I would say is not that common, it's only 56 patients here compared to 115 with uh, high-grade disease, then 85% of those patients will have muscle invasive disease. If you have either or, uh, sorry, if you have, if you have both, uh, it's 86%. If you have either or, it's 59%. Um, so these are, the idea here is if you could predict muscle invasive disease with your biopsy findings, it would help you to uh, determine the need for new adjuvant chemotherapy. Maybe more sophisticated to use a nomogram, something like this that includes points for ureter versus pelvis, low versus high grade, papillary versus sessile, and there are other parameters that can fit into this. But um, grade by itself is probably not uh, enough. Uh, of course, we know that there is um, a significant risk of understaging with endoscopic uh, management. If we, um, what, one in three patients with low grade TA disease who undergo nephrodectomy will have uh, muscle invasive disease. So we always need to be, there's a risk of undergrading and here also risk of understaging. So we always need to consider this. These, however, typically will be larger tumors, which is why they're undergoing nephrodectomy. So it does not, it should not deter us from doing uh, renal preservation. So in summary, I think um, there are significant challenges in, uh, in upper tract diagnostics and the big, big issue is getting adequate tissue for diagnosis. I'd say that the three E's of biopsy, you need optimal equipment, you need the expertise to do it and it needs to be something you're doing regularly and then you need exactitude. And with that, I just mean you need to be meticulous, attention to detail, um, really trying to get the best possible uh, tissue for, for diagnosis and risk stratification. And I think risk stratification is important in upper tract disease. It's not all about just doing an nephrodectomy. In low risk patients, we wanna spare the kidney and, and manage endoscopically. And in high risk patients, we wanna consider new adjuvant chemotherapy before nephrodectomy.